Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the reflections and meditations of all these assembled hearts be acceptable, O Lord, to you. For you are our rock, and you are our Redeemer. Amen. Dear people of God, so good to be with you. I am Dr. Ben Haupt, or Ben, as my family calls me. I teach at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, and I am uh, grateful to be here with you this morning to bring you the Word of God. It's summertime, right? How's your summer going? You've been uh, maybe getting around a little bit. Maybe you're in town for this baptism. Uh, Maybe uh, you've had a chance to uh, be around a little bit have a little bit of of vacation time. My family and I have had some vacation this summer, and that's where the sermon begins. So my son Noah and I, early this summer, went to Glacier National Park. Anybody been to Glacier National Park? A couple of you? Okay. Glacier National Park. So in Glacier National Park, northwestern Montana, it's it's wilderness, and it's a a beautiful place. I, I worked there in the summer of 2000 when I was in between college and seminary and so being back 23 years later was an amazing experience and every place that I see where I stayed the cabin that I lived in while I was the breakfast cook all summer I'm taking pictures of every place right like you do when you're on vacation you get your phone out and you're taking all kinds of pictures so Noah and I start out on this hike it's a hike to a place called Iceberg Lake Trail. Iceberg Lake's a beautiful place. And I had had some experiences there, so I was really excited to make to take Noah on this trail to Iceberg Lake. We get out and walk in and we're we're in a couple of miles and Noah's saying, uh, how much further, Dad? Right, Noah? Yep. And um, so I'm just saying, you know, enjoy the hike. Watch, watch what's going on, take pictures. And as his interest starts to wane a little bit in the hike, I start to think, I gotta jazz this up a little bit. So I tell Noah about my experience on Iceberg Lake Trail in the summer of 2000. I was with about 10 friends who all worked in Glacier National Park, and we were hiking on Iceberg Lake, and about halfway in on the trail, No joke, we came across a grizzly bear. The grizzly bear was probably, uh, I'll say from me to the window. That's that's close, right? If you've never been in a national park, you don't want to be that close to a grizzly bear. It's not like seeing them in the zoo. So I'm telling Noah this story. I'm trying to get him excited. You know, there there could be bears here. So we're plodding along, and Noah, this is where we saw the bear, and so we, we go past it, and we're still taking pictures, and it's turning into a, a long hike. And we come around a bend, and I see this, this guy and his partner, or spouse, or girlfriend, or whatever, and he's all. So Noah and I, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what he sees, but we're slowly walking up, and he points. Ooh, the hair stands up on the back of my neck. And it's close. I mean, it's not from me to the window, but it's probably from me to the, the back doors of the church. Right? Close enough that you're nervous. I'm nervous. But you know what we did? When we saw this grizzly bear? Yep, we pulled out our phones. We started taking pictures. Then I, I say, Noah, let's do this. We turn around, I get my phone, right? Like I'm at Disney World, and I snap a selfie with the grizzly bear in the background. I think, oh, what an amazing experience. And, and we, we went on, the, the grizzly was, was far enough away that I, I was not concerned for our safety. Uh, but we get back to the seminary, and I, I teach uh, at the seminary. I, I love interacting with students. And I was telling 
uh, one of the students this story. Oh, we saw this grizzly bear, and, and you know, it was really cool, and let me show you the picture. And they're like, you, you took a selfie with a grizzly bear? What were you thinking, right? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that is, that is kind of dumb. I mean, it wasn't quite as bad as, like, I told Noah to stick his hand in a pot of honey and then go down and take a picture with the nice uh, cuddly grizzly bear, but it wasn't the wisest move, right? I probably should have been a little bit more particular with what we were dealing with because grizzly bears, they can run about 30 miles per hour. And uh, just a few weeks after we were there, um, tragically, a woman lost her life because of an encounter with the grizzly bear. It's serious stuff. What does this have to do with God? What does this have to do with the Bible? Dear brothers and sisters, I wonder sometimes, I certainly experience this, that as we plod along through life, we see all these different moments. Today there will be moments for selfies and pictures with the baby and uh, we go through life and there are all these moments. We grab our phones out, we take a picture, and then we move on. I wonder sometimes if we're just so caught up in the day to day that we forget that here we are in the presence of the living God. Do you ever get bored with church? Do you ever get bored? with uh, the message. Now, I don't get bored with Pastor Nathan. I don't get bored with the music because we could be members at a lot of different places and I really like Reliant. And so, uh, no, I I don't get bored uh, with the preaching, with the music. But you know what I sometimes get bored with? God. You ever kind of go through life and you're so focused on a million other things and God himself is not your all-consuming concern. Today in the scriptures, I want to dig into two stories. One kind of a negative example of somebody who's just kind of plodding through life, taking pictures, you know, taking selfies, even thinking, wow, I think I know where God's story is going. And it doesn't turn out so well. And another story of somebody who shows us what it would really be like, what what we would do well to emulate in our relationship with God. Turn with me to 2 Samuel 3 on page 256. 256. 2 Samuel chapter 3. So we read this uh, as an Old Testament reading, and um, after we read this, sure enough, my family was like, yeah, Dad, uh, I'm not sure where you're going with this message, right? So um, let me try to connect the pieces. 2 Samuel chapter 3, starting at verse 2, it says, And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Ammon of Ahinoam of Jezreel, and all these names, right? When you're reading the Bible... When you're listening to the Bible in church, do your eyes ever glaze over? Why all these names? It was fun uh, that Pastor Nathan read all the names this morning, right? So that I didn't have to read them. He did a great job with them. Uh, But do do your eyes ever glaze over when you're reading the Bible or listening to the Bible on your walk or on your commute and you think, Why did God think this was important to have in the scriptures? Sometimes I'm that way, and it's a little bit like taking a picture, taking a selfie with a grizzly bear. We're like, oh, I don't know. I don't understand this passage. What, What does this have to do with me? Get on with it, right? But I want to dive a little bit deeper into the story of 2 Samuel. Verse 1 Take a look at 2 Samuel 3, verse 1. It says, There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into that story. 
You know Saul, right? The first king of Israel. He was a big deal. Israel never had a king. And God's people said, we want a king. And God chose Saul. And eventually, Israel has a second king, and it's David. So, what does all this have to do with us? Well, I think the writer of the book of 2 Samuel is trying to bring us into God's story. He doesn't want us to just plod through life. He doesn't want our eyes to glaze over and say, what in the world is this all about? So he puts at the very beginning, at 2 Samuel chapter 1, flip one page to the left with me, to 2 Samuel 1, there's an interesting story about an Amalekite. This Amalekite, Here's what happens. Here's the basic summary. And you can kind of follow along as I'm telling this story on uh, page 254. So this Amalekite is on the battlefield and Saul, Israel's first king, is in battle. And Saul, the first king, gets mortally wounded or almost mortally wounded. He's barely hanging on. And this this Amalekite that's on the battlefield comes upon Saul, and Saul's like, dude, put me out of my misery. Like, I'm going to die, and so I need somebody. Here's my spear, right? I I want to be an honorable person. I'm not going to do myself in. You do it for me. Welcome to the Bible and fun stories for children, right? So... This Amalekite does what Saul says. The Amalekite puts Saul to death. And then he takes the crown off of Saul's head and he sprints back to David because he knows David is supposed to be the new king of Israel. And he's all like, David, Saul is dead. And here, O king, is your crown. Oh, he's so excited. And David, the hairs stand up on the back of David's neck. What in the world were you thinking? Take a look with me at 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 8. And he said to him, Who are you? I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And David said to, and he said to me, stand beside and kill me. This is the Amalekite talking about what Saul said. Stand beside me and kill me for anguish has seized me and yet my life still lingers. So I stood beside him and I killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm and I have brought them to here to my Lord. David took hold of his clothes and took or them. Verse 14, David said to him, how is it you were not afraid to put your hand out to destroy the Lord's anointed? The Amalekite was so wrapped up in, I think I know my part in God's story. I think I understand what God is about. And he takes this crown, puts it in David's hands, And David says, you have no idea who you're messing with. David says, you killed the Lord's anointed. God himself picked this one and you killed him. So what does David do to the Amalekite? Take a look. Verse 14, he struck him down so that he died. David was not messing around because David feared God above everything else. David was not like somebody that just comes upon God and is like, hey, let me take a selfie, cool. He wasn't just plodding along thinking, I got this all figured out. David took it seriously, but the Amalekite, I think is kind of a warning to us in 2 Samuel as we're reading through these Old Testament books. Don't be like the Amalekite that thinks, I got God's story all figured out. I know where this is all going, right? 
be full of fear and trembling. So when we get to 2 Samuel 3, and it's asking the question about David's sons, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it's about who's going to be the next king. It's about where is God's story going and what is God doing in our world? 2 Samuel chapter 3 lists off David's sons because in 2 Samuel 3 verse 10, look at what it says, the last verse of our Old Testament reading. The Lord has sworn to David to transfer the kingdom from his house to Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. And it says later in Samuel that, that David uh, would have the throne forever. David would be the Lord's king forever. So somebody's going to rule in David's place. The whole Old Testament, what is the whole Old Testament about? It's about who's going to be the next after David. All these different kings, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, they're all terrible kings. We're always waiting for who's going to be God's anointed king. And we're always waiting for a good king, a better king. All through the Old Testament, and Jesus says in John 5, 39, these Old Testament scriptures, they're about me, right? Jesus says all the scriptures point to me. So we come up, we have, we have this example of the Amalekite. Don't be like the Amalekite, right? The selfie snapping, just plodding through life. I think I have this all figured out. I know what God is doing. Kind of boring, kind of, okay, another Sunday, another sermon, another church service. I think I know where all this is going. It's, it's just all kind of boring. Let's get on with uh, something that's a little more exciting, right? Turn with me to Mark chapter 10 on page 847. There's a blind man, and Jesus is walking through town, and everybody in the Gospel of Mark is wondering, who is this Jesus, and what's he all about? That's a good question for life, right? That's a good question for us to be asking. Who is this Jesus, and what's he all about? Do you have Jesus figured out? I don't think I have Jesus figured out. I got a PhD in the New Testament, and I am more convinced every day that I don't fully understand what the New Testament is all about. The m deeper you go, the more you think, there's, there's an awful lot here. And maybe I haven't been paying attention enough. So, the blind man Bartimaeus, right? He's, he's waiting for Jesus. And you know the story, right? You know, basically, maybe when this scripture was read, you, okay, there's a blind man. And and Jesus comes along and he interacts with him and then the blind man is healed and it's a nice New Testament story right and we've glossed over this incredible detail that Mark the gospel writer wants us to see take a look at Mark 10 48 many rebuke the blind man telling him to be silent shut up be quiet but the blind man cried out all the more. What does he call Jesus? Somebody shout it out if you see it in your Bible. Son of David. Whoa. This blind man who can't see, who has to be helped to the next place, he sees who Jesus really is. This guy has been listening to the Bible. The son of David? That's a big deal. I need to know who this son of David is. I need to know more about him. And when this blind man says, Jesus, son of David, the blind man knows something 
that maybe even some of the disciples didn't understand. It's not like the blind man is like the Amalekite, the like, I have God's story all figured out, let me do something for you. This Amalekite, this, this blind man, it's like son of David, you could wreck me. You could crush me. You are the king of Israel. You are God's anointed. God has picked you. And you could be like David and just put me to death right here, right now. With fear and trembling, the blind man kneels at Jesus' feet and says, Son of David, have mercy on me. It's a great way for us to think about who our God is and how we relate to Him. Martin Luther said that the whole Christian life is one of daily repentance. Daily falling on our knees and saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. I messed up. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not taking you seriously. My eyes have glazed over again and I've forgotten who you are in my life. Martin Luther also said that the, the best thing that a Christian can do in the first commandment, remember his explanation of the first commandment? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. I think we sometimes don't talk enough about the fear of God. We're like, taking a selfie with God, like, hey, look, it's us. Another, another shot. Maybe the hairs need to stand up on the back of our neck a little bit more sometimes as we read the scriptures and we say, son of David, I'm in the presence of the living God. I don't know what you're doing with my life. I don't know where things are going to go next. And all that I have is to cry out to you. Brothers and sisters, there's good news for us. How many of you have seen uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or read the book? All right, a couple of you have, lots of you have. In the story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the children are talking with uh, these, these animals, uh, and they're talking about Aslan, who in C.S. Lewis's Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe represents God. And the children ask these animals about Aslan, is he safe? Kind of like that grizzly bear down there. Are we safe? Are we okay? They ask the animals, is Aslan safe? And the animals say, safe? Heavens, no. He's not safe, but he is good. God, our God, the living God, the one who made all heaven and all of earth, is he safe? No, he's not safe, but he is good. So good that he fulfilled his promise to David that someday a son of David would come and he'd be a king that would take care of his people. So good that this king would even sacrifice his very self, his very life, for people that didn't understand him. For people that plotted through life and didn't take him seriously. For people that would show up on a Sunday morning and go, okay, let's get this on with, we gotta get to these other things even for people like us. He sacrificed and gave his very life, Jesus did, to be our king. Not to exact payments from us or taxes or anything else, but because he loves us. Is our God safe? Nope. But he is good. I hope. That as you continue to dig deeper into the scriptures, as you continue to go back over some of these stories and go, I think I missed that detail. Continue to pray to our God, who is so very good.
sent his son to be with us, sent his spirit to help us to read the scriptures. May he continue to be with us so that we might fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Amen.